So hello everyone, I am Rebecca Vanuk, the Executive Director of Library Reads. Um, and welcome to the 21st installment of the Mystery at the Library Book Club series brought to you by Sourcebooks and Baker and Taylor. So again, like I said, I'm Rebecca Vanuk and I'm from Library Reads. I won't take up too much of your time. Most of you are probably familiar with us. If you are not, please check out our website, which is librarireads.org where you can learn all about what we do, including our monthly top 10 list, the various events that we participate in. And a new thing I wanted to point out really quickly, we have sponsorship funds available. So if you are looking to go to something like ALA or your state conference, or you want to attend a webinar online that there's a charge for, please check out our website for how you can apply for grant money from us. We also are newly offering money to your libraries and institutions to bring in authors, for example, um, anything that's readers advisory related that you need funding for, please check out our website and we'll see what we can do for you. But what we're really here for tonight, not talking about library reads, not talking about money, talking about mysteries, mystery at the library. Welcome to our friends on Facebook streaming as well. You are all in for a treat tonight because I have three wonderful authors to talk to. We have Frederick Weisel, Luca Vesti, and Thomas Kyes got all of their new books right here. Very exciting stuff. But before we dig into them, I do have my usual housekeeping things to share. If you have questions for our authors tonight, and we know you do, please use the Google form that is in the chat box. Um, our friends here are going to answer the questions in the latter half of the program. I have some questions to start off with, then we do our fun poll that we do, and then we get into our audience questions. So don't forget to submit those using the Google form. Also, don't forget when you do participate by asking a question or playing in the trivia poll, you'll be entered to win a mystery book bundle from our friends at Sourcebooks. The winners will be announced at the conclusion of the event. So let's get right into, into, into introducing our authors tonight. First up, we've got Frederick Weisel. Frederick's been a writer and editor for more than 30 years and his articles have appeared in the Boston Globe, the Washington Post and Christian Science Monitor. He lives with his wife in Santa Rosa, California and shares a birthday with his favorite author, Raymond Chandler. Welcome, Frederick. Next up then, we've got Luca Vesti. He is a writer of Italian and Liverpudlian heritage, married with two young daughters and one of nine children. He studied psychology and criminology at university in Liverpool. He is the author of the Murphy and Rossi series, and you can find him online at lucavesti.com and on Twitter at lucavesti. And then we have, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what happens when you give me three. I don't know what to do anymore. Next, here we've got Thomas Kyes, author of the Geneva Chase Mystery Series. Thomas lives and writes on a barrier island in the coast of North Carolina with his wife, Cindy, and Annie, their Shih Tzu. He was Edgar nominated for the 2022 Sue Grafton Memorial Award for his last book, Shadow Hill. Whisper Room, his fifth book in the Geneva Chase Mystery Series, is due for release in August of this year. Thomas has had a long career working for newspapers and magazines, primarily in New England and New York, and is currently working on his next novel. And this, what we're talking about tonight, is the first in a new series. So, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, Luca especially is coming to us many hours in the future. So uh, <laughs> we're not going to let him doze off tonight. We're gonna try and keep him keep him awake and, and ready to go here. So shout out your questions for us. But first of all, let's get into some questions. <laughs> we're gonna dig right in. Um, for those in the audience who might be new to your books, give us an elevator pitch on on your latest book and um frederick just because you're appearing on my screen first i'm going to have you go first okay sure thank you um the silenced women is the story of a um five police homicide detectives in santa rosa california and they're investigating a um homicide of a young woman in the park 
and the case has similarities to two unsolved cold cases, um, also homicides of young women. And so the team ends up investigating both the recent homicide and, and the other cold cases. Um, complicating matters, the lead detective, Eddie Mahler, is suffering a severe migraine headache through the whole story. And he's carrying on imaginary conversations with one of the earlier victims. So that's kind of the premise, the uh, starting point for the story. All right, great. Luca, would you like to tell us about your book? Yes, so The Bone Keeper is a standalone novel following Detective Louise Henderson. And the, the, the story is about um, that age old question of what if the myth that you grew up with of, of, of uh, something strange that lurks in, a, in the woods actually turned out to be real. Um, and Louise has grown up with this story in Liverpool of something called The Bone Keeper, which children used to scare each other with. And when she becomes a detective and isn't, you know, 20 years after she's heard these stories and bodies start appearing, it may be that the myth is more real than she thought. Mm, spooky. Thomas, tell us about Random Road. Uh, Random Road is about uh, Geneva Chase. She's an investigative reporter. Uh, she drinks too much. Uh, she's been married three times. She's just broken up with uh, having an affair with a married man. Uh, she's lost every good job that she's ever had, and she ends up at her hometown newspaper in uh, Fairfield County, Connecticut, and frankly, she's a hot mess. Um, she is uh, finds herself on a crime scene. Uh, six people are found hacked to death on an island in Long Island Sound, and she discovers that this is her last chance to get back into the game. But uh, it's going to be a long shot, and as it turns out, uh, she might end up getting killed before uh, she actually figures out who done it. Ooh, hot mess express. All right. Well, I can tell you, so I have, I have read these. I can tell our audience these are all fabulous page turners, keep you up at night. And so now we want to talk to you about how you sort of got into writing these, this, this style of book. So of course, this is mystery at the library, so we know you write mysteries. Um, you have each have a whole cadre of mysteries behind you, and these three are all sort of in that police procedural category. Now, I also found it interesting um, that particularly Luca's book and also Frederick's. There's there's a bit of suspense. Isn't really the word I'm looking for. Um, not quite paranormal, but ish, right? You know, we have we have this whole urban legend in Luca's book, right? And in Frederick's, we have this, you know, he's talking to ghosts of the past, if you will. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about writing style, right? So that is that's definitely these are not just straight mysteries there's there's a lot of extra padding in there which readers just of course love so i would really like to hear what made you decide to sort of not just go straight law and order police procedural type what made you add some of those things in there um luca i'm gonna go ahead and, and let you answer first so the bone keeper uh, while it was the second novel that i had published in the in the states it was actually my fifth novel that I'd written um, and released in, in the UK. And I'd written four novels in the Murphy and Rossi series that you mentioned earlier, which were very much more straight police procedurals, uh, you know, with a variety of, 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 you know, serial killers and, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, and I'd always had this idea about this urban legend coming to life. I grew up with, a, with an urban legend in my area um, that turned out to be a real person. <laughs> so we grew up with this story that all the kids knew, but we I didn't know until I was in well into my twenties that that it actually was a real person. He just wasn't you know killing and chasing children. He was doing very various other strange things. So I had this idea for the Bone Keeper for a long time, but I knew it wouldn't work within the setting of of my police procedural series because I wanted the reader to kind of always question whether or not. Is this supernatural? Is this kind of paranormal kind of thing going on? Um, so that was why it became a standalone. Um, 
And it was a very different book than the first four novels because, as you say, it, it did kind of draw on other genres. Um, so there are horror elements to it, there, there are suspense and, and, and paranormal elements to it. Um, but there was very much a core of the police procedure because the main character is a detective who is still trying to solve a crime. Um, it's just that that added extra bit of the of the paranormal was in there. <laughs> and that, that's uh, so yeah. It's, I, I kind of it was kind of like a, a bridging point there because since then I've kind of moved away from the police procedural entirely. Um, so it, it was kind of like my jumping off from going from straight police procedural to kind of testing myself as a writer. I, should, I suppose is to say, can I move away from kind of this this genre into something? a little bit more different um, and a bit more that kind of matched what I enjoyed reading more than anything. Oh, that's, thank you for sharing that with us. That's a very interesting insight to know. Uh, Frederick, tell us a little bit about what makes yours stand apart from straight up police procedural. So, um, so I am more interested in the characters than in the whodunit part. And part of it was years ago, I read this series of Swedish mysteries. Um, uh, the detective is named Martin Beck and they're written by a husband and wife team, uh, Mai Soval and Per Valur. And it, they're about a team of detectives in different Swedish cities. And I really was attracted to that idea of not just one detective, but a whole team bringing different personalities, uh, different skills. And um, so when I wrote this book, what I really wanted to focus on was the characters of the detectives, the characters of the victims and, and the families of the victims and um, spend some time uh, getting to know them and using uh, interior monologue to understand how they're thinking. Um, so I wanted to, to have the mystery pace and the police procedural structure, but I really wanted to focus on who they are as people. Uh, and that's why you get, you know, Eddie talking to this woman who was killed two years earlier. He's still trying to sort of process what happened uh, in, that, in that crime. Got it. And Thomas, I want to direct the same question to you about Random Road, although there's not any kind of supernatural element, we really, you've got quite the character there in Geneva. She's not, you know, as you, uh, I love it. Hot Mess Express is one of my favorite expressions. So it's, it's fun, but you've really given her this sort of um, damaged background. So it's not quite so cut and dry as, oh, reporter comes in, reporter figures out what's going on. We leave reporter behind. Oh no, we dig into what's going on with this reporter. So tell me a little bit about why you gave Geneva the, the the rich kind of um, backstory that she's got. Ge Geneva Chase is actually based on uh, two women. I worked at at my loose last newspaper in Connecticut. Ah. Um, Geneva is a I mean she's whip smart. Um, she's a smart ass. She says things that I can't get away with. That's why I love to write her. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know she's she's made a shambles out of her life, and at at the point I was working at a newspaper, we we all drank like fish. Um, can't do it anymore, but um, you know we did it back then, and uh, that was that was Geneva, and Geneva Chase actually um, she falls in love with her childhood sweetheart, who's got a daughter, and uh, the woman that I based the 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 character on same thing happened and she ended up raising uh this gentleman's kids and sending them through college and i respected the hell out of her and she's she's made something out of her life and i couldn't be any prouder and she's she's my geneva chase i that's why that character is so special to me she's she's very very real I love it. That's great. Well, i think that this is exactly the kind of thing that people enjoy getting to learn from authors is is where these characters come from. I mean, it's really fascinating to hear the, the people or stories, things that you've based these on. So I appreciate you sharing those with us. And it's very clear um, for anyone who hasn't 
had the chance to start reading these yet. These are extremely character driven mysteries. I think sometimes when people think of the police procedural, they really do sort of think of, oh, like Law and Order, where, you know, you might have your recurring characters, but everybody's just sort of, once the crime is done and figured out, then we toss it all away. And these are not, oh, toss it away and forget it books. These are books that these, these characters are really going to get into your head and they're really going to stick with you. And that's what makes them so marvelous. So just wanted to, to get that out there. But talking about police procedurals as an example of mysteries. So one of the things that I think all three of you do very well and probably had to put a lot of work into is getting those details correct. Um, we, we know for sure every author that I talk to in the mystery genre specifically does lots of research into um, what it actually happens in law enforcement, what actually happens when crimes are being investigated, because there are intrepid readers out there that will be quick to point out that, oh no, you've tainted that crime scene, or no one would ever do that when they're, you know, investigating such and such. So can you tell us a little bit about something interesting that you may have learned while researching um, your book. And it doesn't even need to be these. If you've got a story to tell us from one of your previous books where you were like, oh, I was reading up on XYZ and wow, discovered this, we would love to hear it. Um, Thomas, since you spoke last, oh, you were just grabbing a drink of water too. No, I'm like no, the worst fine. waiter, that's right? Um, um, tell, us, tell us about your research. How do you how do you research to make sure you've got the details authentic? And do you have a good story for us about some of these? Yeah, well, uh, of course, the newspaper end of it, I, I can write without too much of a problem. But the uh, uh, the investigative part of it. Um, I've got cop friends, I've got attorney friends, I've got judge friends who I can tap if I have any questions. Like with the second book, uh, a girl looks like she's been kidnapped and I needed to find out, well, how, you know, how long is she missing before somebody files a missing uh, persons report? In the first book, Random Road, one of the things that I had to learn about that I didn't know much about was how, how crime scenes are cleaned up. Ah, um, see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's something I really didn't know about. And frankly, it's something that most people really don't and you really <laughs> don't, don't want to know, know about. about. <laughs> no. So it, uh, that, that, was, that was kind of an experience, too, you know. <laughs> did you go on any fact-finding missions or did you just interview people or read up on it? I just, I talked to people and read up on it. I have okay. no desire. Really okay. to, to, I was going to gonna say that, that might be... Um, Sacrificing too much for your art, huh? Yeah, <laughs> Having I'll, to I'll go. Do, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll do a lot, and I'll go a lot of different places. But I just assume not be there. Thank you very much. Understood. Understood. So, um, Frederick, how about you? We seem to have lost Luca for a moment, um, but I'm sure our team at Sourcebooks is hard at work getting him logged back in. But uh, Frederick, tell us about how how you research to make sure you've got your, your investigation details and do you have any good stories for us? So um, actually I wrote the book um, without uh, really researching the local police department at all. And um, I decided I would write a book about these five detectives, five homicide detectives. And after the book was finished, um, I found out that our local police department actually does have a team of five homicide detectives. And so it all worked out. You know, I'm, I'm glad my book uh, matched reality. But I love it. After I finished the book, my wife and I took a class here with the local police department. It's called the Citizens Police Academy. And it was um, very intense, very comprehensive. It was uh, eight three-hour classes plus wow. two all-day Saturday classes. And I learned a lot. I, I learned that I didn't do anything wrong in Silenced Women, but I learned a lot for the second book about policies and um, practices. And it included a ride along where you go with a police officer in his car for three or four hours of, of his work. And um, that was very um, educational for me. It taught me a lot about what, what it's really like. I will bet. Have you have you been able to use anything that you learned, or or did you kind of was it was it more? It sounds like it was very reassuring that you were on the right track with with how investigations go. Did you put anything um, from real life into your book, perhaps? Um, 
No, I, I, um, I think what I did was I, I learned how the teams actually work and how they, um, they wrote every three to five years, they rotate from one team to another. So they don't stay in one place. Uh -huh. And in my second book, I talk about that, how they, they go from homicide to gang crimes to drugs or something like that. So, so I did use that. Fascinating. Uh, I, I do yeah. have a story. I, in one of these classes, I was talking to a young detective and he was uh, trained in the military and then became a police officer. And I was talking to him about his work and he was very forthcoming. And then I told him I was writing a mystery about uh, the police department and I could see the interest just go out of his eyes completely. And I realized that this officer was exactly like my character, Steve Frames, who would never be interested in someone writing a mystery. And it was, it was very eerie to be talking to someone who was like my own character. That must have been fascinating. Yes. Did you? Did, <laughs> it must have been very hard to sort of like keep a straight face while you were talking to him. Like, hmm, did I just write you into existence? Perhaps that's 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 fascinating. Um, so, Thomas, I also want to ask you a little bit, sort of on the same theme, but. So you have um, decided, or or just maybe just fell into, I guess, perhaps writing female main characters. Did you know that question was coming? I see the little, the little smirk there. So tell me a little bit. I'm sure that you didn't research women, <laughs> although maybe you did, and that's a whole different conversation. But tell us a little bit about getting into sort of the female voice, if you will. Yeah, when I first started writing Random Road, it was an experiment. Uh, one chapter would be from the viewpoint of Geneva Chase, female reporter. And the other uh, viewpoint would be from Kevin Bell, my male protagonist. And I would go on like that. And about 10 chapters into it, I realized that uh, Kevin Bell was a nice guy, uh, but he was nearly not as interesting as Geneva Chase was. Like I said, she's a smart ass and she says things I don't get, I can't get away with. Um, so I wrote the whole book from her viewpoint. It was just an experiment and it got published. <laughs> so who knew? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it did so well that uh, Poison Pen Press asked for two more Geneva Chase books. And, nice. what, and I kind of had written myself into a hole with Random Road. Uh, it, the book ended, the story arc was finished, the character arc was done. So I had to kind of start fresh again. And uh, Geneva Chase, I, it, she's she's popular. I, you know, who wouldn't who would thought? And you know, I I have a female uh, editor. I have a female publisher, female agent, female publicist, and of course my wife Cindy keeps me straight. Um, so you know, if anything goes off kilter with the way I'm writing Geneva, they certainly let me know. And between you and me, I know a lot more about women's shoes than any man ever really should. <laughs> All in the name of important literary research, right? All, all in the name of fiction, yep. Right, <laughs> right. Um, so I have word here that Luca's internet went out, but he's restarting it. So he'll come back to us in just a minute. Um, and when he gets back on, I'm gonna go back to that question with him, but we'll just keep things moving forward here because I know one of the things our audience is always very interested in, and so sorry to anybody who may have submitted this as your own Q&A, but I'm going to ask it here. Um, everyone's always very interested in how authors write, basically, as a job. Some people need a regimented schedule. You know, I've talked to lots of authors who say, I get up at whatever time every morning and I have to write for at least an hour before I allow myself to do anything else. Then I have all kinds of authors that say, no, 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 I write when the muse hits me. I, you know, go ahead and just, and, and start writing when the story speaks to me, half a novel in a single setting. What does your writing process look like? And Luca, I'm going to give you a moment to sort of settle back in before I start asking you questions again. Uh, so, so Frederick, why don't you go ahead and take that one for me, please? Okay, sure. Um, when I wrote Silenced Women, I was working full time oh. as, as a science writer. Okay. And so I would get up at six o'clock or 5.30 and I'd come into my office and I'd write for three hours on the novel before I started my day of writing as a science writer. 
Um, and so for that reason, it took me a long time. It took me over seven years to write, write the book. Oh, wow. uh, now I'm retired and uh -huh. um, I, can write full, I can write fiction full time. And I tend to come in early and I work uh, up until about noon. I find I can't write all day. And in the afternoon I do research and I generally work seven days a week. Um, okay. And so I, I find I'm freshest in the morning, so I, li I, I like to do that. And I'd also say that I do a lot of rewriting. Um, and uh, I, there's, a, there's a scene in Silenced Women, I won't spoil it, but there's a scene where one character discovers something in the trunk of his car while he's driving. And I rewrote that scene 40 times. Because really? I did not get it exactly right. And okay. I, it's four pages, but I just kept reworking it. But that's, uh, that, that's some idea of my process. Okay, great. Uh, Luca, I'm gonna bring you back into the fold here. Um, tell us a little bit about your writing sort of schedule, writing style. Everyone likes to know, you know, how the sausage gets made. Uh, well, um, it's, it's, it, it, it can differ from book to book. Most of the time though now I'm, I'm kind of, I'm in a kind of set routine where um, I, I get up at, at, you know, in the morning, see the kids off to school, uh, my wife into her, you know, like a, a real job. And then I sit down at my desk, I'll, you know, ponder for a bit, you answer some emails. And then by nine, half nine, I'm writing and I'll, and I'll continue on until, you know, so the you know people start filtering back into the house, but it's a, it's a lovely you know quiet time at the moment uh, with the you know children in school, wife and work. There's no one else here, which can sometimes lead to some procrastination um, because obviously you know <laughs> you've got no one over your shoulder making sure that you are writing. It's you know it's difficult, but every book has been different. Um, you know it's it's it, you know I have I've gone through pro, uh, books where I've written only at night. You know where it's that that it just felt right for the book, the Bonekeeper, for example, because of the the, the kind of the book it was. I found that I I wrote most of the the, the things that like stayed in the book late at night, um, and I don't know what that was. I don't know if it was just like a, you know a different feeling of like the kind of the darkness that that, that, that was in the book. It mm -hmm. kind of helped. It was kind of dark outside, uh, but yes, lately it's been very much like a nine to five job with a lot of breaks to watch you know you know things on tally when no one else is around that type of thing <laughs> sounds like the ideal gig i'll take it yeah <laughs> <laughs> and thomas how about you and your your writing layout well as we talked about before we we started this i i actually have a day job i i work as the president of our county's chamber of commerce um, so mostly I work on weekends. I, I write on weekends and that's really all I do. And uh, so I don't get beach time in. Uh, I sit in front of my laptop and just and jam on it. Um, and I'm a lot like Frederick. I do a lot of rewriting. I've got scenes that I've rewritten and rewritten and rewritten, especially the, the very start of any novel that I write. I'll, I'll rewrite the hell out of that because I'm never happy with it. As a matter of fact, if I if I had a, a, my druthers, I'd probably go back and rewrite Random Road. Um, you're just never happy. You're never satisfied. And then mm -hmm. finally, you, you, you get down to it. So, um, and I work better under deadline when uh, Sourcebooks says, okay, well, you know, we, we like concept your book, we want it by July. That's when I really <laughs> dig in. And, uh, you know, no more screwing around, no more watching the television, Luca. I, 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 just, <laughs> I just do it, you know? So there you go. All right, see, we all kind of like that inside information. So uh, Luca, I'd like to bring you back up to where we lost you there for a moment. Um, I was asking on that um, research, what kind of research you have done for your books and if you have any kind of good stories maybe about something that occurred to you while you were researching or maybe do you not research at all? I've had plenty of authors tell me, ah, I just, the story just comes to me. I rely on my editor to tell me if I've got something really crazy in there, but otherwise, <laughs> hey, it's fiction. Tell us a little bit about your your researching and, and, and all of that, getting your details straight. I do a lot of research and a lot of it doesn't end up in the book is the thing that, okay. you know, if you, it, you know, it, it, there are Wikipedia articles for if you want to know everything. Um, but I mean, I, I do- All down that uh, rabbit hole. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I have done many, many times. 
Um, but for the police procedure, I, I spoke to uh, people in uh, people in the police to, to to you know to find out if what I was doing was right. What I learned was that ninety five percent of their job was very very boring and involved a lot of paperwork and not a lot of running around and chasing bad guys. So you have to leave all of that out because otherwise, you know, there would be just two hundred pages of have you got form A one two? I need to, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So. Um, I, I I did a lot of that, but for the for the bone keeper, I mean, there was there was a there was a there's a scene at the beginning of the book that involves a tunnel in the middle of the woods, um, which is based on a very real tunnel that exists in in woods near where I live, um, and it set at night, so I thought, well, I'm going to have to go and experience this, and and to now it's it's deep into the woods. So when I started, I thought, well, I'll go when it's like still quite, you know, light outside. Uh, you know, it's like that weird kind of time between like, you know, afternoon and evening, um, dusk, I think it's called. Um, so by the time I got to it, though, it was it was pretty pitch black. It was it was pretty dark and there are no lights. There's nothing. And, and I had my phone with the little torch and that wasn't really doing much. Um, but I, I got out there and, uh, and I got to this tunnel. I thought, right now I've got to walk through it. And it was about halfway through when I heard the first noise. And I thought, uh oh. <laughs> and to cut a long short story short, uh, I'd interrupted uh, 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 two teenagers who were um who were obviously who had obviously heard of the tunnel as well. And I'd interrupted them having a, a private moment. <laughs> and, and, and but yeah, I never I've never, happened in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been back to the woods at night again, just in case. But yeah, that. For about for about twenty seconds, I thought I was going to die, and I thought this is this is. I thought you know, like I, I become a writer, Luca. You can live it. You know, you can just you never need to leave the house again. You can, you know, it's it's fine. And and then you find yourself in the middle of the woods, at, 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 you know, in, in the dark, and there are noises in a tunnel because you think that might be a good idea. But um, that, research is great. Though I, I love because I'm always le- I always like to learn, and that's mm-hmm. what I kind of I've, I use my books for is for learning. That's excellent. I think that is what a lot of readers enjoy about reading, right? Like everything you read, even if it's fiction, even if it's made up, you are taken to a new place that maybe you've never been before. You're taken to a new time period. You you meet people that you don't have the chance to meet in real life and you're always learning. So that's a that's an excellent, excellent answer. Thank you for sharing that with us. So we're gonna move into our trivia in just a moment. But first, I do have one last um, regimented question for the three of you. And that is that everyone here, of course, our audience loves to know what's coming up. We already feel special that we get to read these books, you know, hot off the presses. We get to talk to you guys and find out some of your inside info. So now we'd like to know what is the next project that you're working on Luca go ahead and go first uh, so um next project I mean this is this is a funny one because the bone keeper I actually wrote six years ago so I had to read the back cover and remember what it was about <laughs> um, so, so I'm like four books ahead so uh, the the next book that comes out in the state is a book called you never say goodbye and as I said earlier um the bone keeper was really a bridging point for me of like you know moving from one kind of genre to another and you never say goodbye is a real leap into a completely different genre altogether um it's and it's not set in Liverpool which my previous seven novels have been it's actually set in the south of England uh, for the for the first third and then the last two thirds are set in a small town in Connecticut called Mystic um, ah. which mm-hmm. I visited uh, two weeks before uh, the pandemic uh, I'm not saying I'm responsible for it but I uh, <laughs> the headline on the uh, on the local paper in Connecticut when I left the day I left was first case confirmed in the state so I, I, it, coincidences happen. I'm just that's all I'm international saying. travel. I see. I see. Hmm. But um, yeah, so like that that comes out in December, and that is a about a a, a guy called Sam Cooper who, uh, on his father's deathbed, learns that the story that he's always believed that his mum died when he was ten years old may not be true when his dad says to him, "Your mum is still alive," and that leads him on the quest to find out the truth. Aha. Uh-huh. Fascinating. Frederick, what's coming up next for you? So I'm writing the third book in the series. The uh, second book, The Day He Left, came out uh, March 1st 
uh, just a couple months ago. And I'm working on a third one. I'll have the uh, same team of detectives. Okay. Uh, and the case is, uh, I, I live in wine country. And so this is the murder of a patriarch of a wine family. And um, so I get to tell you all about the wine business here in, in Northern California and through the eyes of a uh, murder investigation. I think maybe you have a lot of extra research that you have to do at, at various wineries, perhaps. Yeah, I have if to you do need that. a research assistant, <laughs> I'm always available. Let's let's okay. uh, talk later. All right. <laughs> all right, excellent, excellent. <laughs> and Thomas, what's what's coming up next from you that we can look forward to? Uh, well, my fifth Geneva Chase, Chase novel uh, called Whisper Room is coming up yeah, for release in August. And awesome. it's basically about an escort service that's run by women. Uh, and blackmail and um, uh, and uh, murder uh, would you know what's better than that? All kinds of good stuff there. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, I, I started working on my uh, next Geneva Chase novel, but simultaneously, uh, this is the first time that you've heard this, but I'm working on a new series, Ooh. and the title of that book, working title right now, is uh, The Saint of Lost Causes. Uh, with a whole new set of characters, so uh, don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> we get the we get the good. See, I get to pull the good stuff out of these guys. It's fun. It's fun. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, let's go ahead and move into our trivia game for tonight. Audience participation always a fun thing here. So, um, our friends at Sourcebooks always put together these fun little trivia polls. And tonight's is guess the police procedural. So in just a moment, a poll question will pop up on your screen and your job will be to figure out which police procedural television show the clues are describing. For our Facebook live participants, the questions will be entered into the comment section and you can go ahead and use that comment section to answer back. And remember that every time you participate, you will be entered to win a mystery prize pack. So the first question is up there on the screen. And while everyone is reading and taking the polls, what I always like to do is ask our authors if they have something that they enjoy reading or something that they would like to recommend to our audience. So Luca, why don't you go first and tell us um, what, what do you like to read and, and what would you like to recommend? So, I, I mean, I read uh, constantly because it's the only way I can still be a writer, I think. Um, and, and, and I read widely across many genres, but what I've been reading a lot lately is much more crime fiction based. Um, and uh, so I, I've, I really recommend Watch Her Fall by Erin Kelly, um, who's a British author who um, I think is just an astounding um, writer. Um, she's she's I think she's our, the British version of Megan Abbott is what I would I would kind of call her. Um, oh, that's just, a great description. She, she does character like uh, you wouldn't believe it's 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 she's just a, a, a brilliant brilliant writer. Um, but similarly, uh, C. L. Taylor with uh, the Guilty Couple. I think that comes out in a couple of months. I was lucky enough to get a, an advanced copy, and that is brilliant uh, domestic suspense. Um, she does it really really well. Um, and uh, No Place to Run by Mark Edwards uh, is another one I've re read recently. Absolutely adore his books. He's written far too many. He's far too talented. And uh, finally, um, one of my favourite, favourite authors is Linwood Barkley. And he mm. has a new one out at the moment called Take Your Breath Away. Uh, and probably everyone's already read it because uh, why wouldn't you? Um, but he is just a fantastic thriller writer. Um, someone I aspire to be as good as one day. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Thank you for those. And we'll get these. Um, our friends at Sourcebooks are going to put these in the chat. So don't worry about taking notes, everyone who's listening. Um, Thomas, why don't you tell us what you're currently reading and what you like to recommend? Uh, well, I just finished City on Fire by Don Winslow. I'm a huge Don Winslow fan. Um, mm -hmm. And I am currently reading uh, David Baldacci's uh, Dreamtown. His Aloysius Archer books are fabulous. It's it's post World War II, and it's a down and dirt, dirty detective uh, novels. I just I absolutely love those. And uh, to be read, uh, Century Road by Greg Isles. I'm looking forward to that. And one of my favorites uh, is a source book writer, 
she's got a book coming out called uh, The Woman in the Library by Solari uh, Gentle. She's uh, an Australian ah. writer and she's, mm -hmm. she's absolutely just special. I, I had a chance to meet her. Uh, I think it was in Dallas during BoucherCon and absolutely adore her. So looking forward to that. That was our top pick for the June library reads list. So many, she's in good, you're in good company. Many, many librarians are already reading and recommending her. So that's fantastic. And Frederick, how about you? So um, I would recommend uh, a British author named Kate Atkinson. Um, she, she has a detective named Jackson Brody and she, there's five books in the series. You don't have to read them in order, but if you do, they'll, they'll, they'll make a lot more sense. And there's one that I really love. It's called Started Early, Took My Dog. And it's just a, a wonderful story. It's, it's complicated, um, but she really takes you into the mind of Jackson Brody while he's doing this research. And, and I, I just love that writing. I've learned a lot from her about how to create character. Um, and then I've just started a book called Slow Horses by Mick Heron. And that's, there's a new TV series on Apple um, you, you, based on, on his novels. I think there's like five or seven of these novels and they're, they're spy thrillers and uh, they're just wonderfully written. Fantastic, thank you for the recommendations. So our trivia, um, in just a moment, we will pop the answers up there for you. The first question was based off a best-selling book. This TV show follows a forensic anthropologist who teams up with an FBI agent to solve murders, and that is Bones. A lot of people got the correct answer on that one. Yay, congratulations. Second question, a crime consultant for the police department uses heightened observational skills and impressive memory to solve cases. And that is Monk. Most of you knew that one as well. Thank you for no one saying it was NYPD Blue. I would have questioned you on that. Um, even I know that that's not what it was. And then here we go, everyone's favorite, Law & Order SVU, TV's longest running primetime live action series following two detectives. Dun dun! That's my impression of the, <laughs> like, did I do a good job with that? I think so, all right. Anyway, so thank you for participating in the trivia. And now we get to the good stuff, the audience questions. And I have a lot of them here, fabulous ones to choose from. I'm gonna start off with this one from Jennifer because I'm gonna ask all three of you this one. Jennifer would like to know if you all, if you were a mystery reader growing up, and if not, when did you become interested in the genre? So Luca, have you always been a mystery fan? Tell us a little bit about that. So the first books that I read uh, were a series of mystery novels by an author called Enid Blyton. I don't know how, how much you would know about her in the States, but she wrote, uh, the, I mean, and these go back to the 30s and 40s, a series okay. called The Famous Five and The Secret Seven, which are very much like, children solving mysteries kind of books and I read those and from like the age of like six or seven to about 10 and then um I stole my dad's copy of The Stand by Stephen King and I kind of spent the rest of, of my teenage life reading horror, horror books and it wasn't until I was in my mid-20s when I kind of returned to the mystery genre and I started reading a lot of British crime fiction and that kind of led me to, to, to you know reading then all, all the classics um and uh, that, I, but I do think it was that kind of initial, you know, love of, of mysteries that, that, that led to me to getting back into them in my mid twenties, which then led to me becoming a writer in that genre as well. Excellent. Frederick, how about you? So I did not read mysteries as a child. Um, and I uh, did a graduate degree uh, in England at the University of Leicester, and it was uh, in Victorian literature. And so I spent a year reading Dickens and Thackeray and Trollope and, you know, every novel was, you know, 800 pages. And um, I did a thesis on Dickens after that. And so after two years of reading all that Victorian literature, I just was burnt out and I needed something different. And so I came back to the States and I was working in a bookstore and I started reading Ross MacDonald and his mysteries are just, um, 
I don't know, they're like hypnotic. They're always about a family and you kind of dig deeper and deeper into the family as, as a detective. And I, I, I was just fascinated by the plot of a mystery and how, you know, it's obviously very different from the generational Victorian novel. And so um, I started reading them and, and, uh, and, 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 and that's where my love of mystery started. There was no going back, huh? Yeah. All right, Thomas, how about you? Well, I'm gonna show my age here. Uh, I, back in the 60s, I, I cut my teeth on the James Bond novels. Um, when we were in uh, middle school and high school, we would buy the Signet uh, paperbacks for 60 cents and pass uh -huh. them around. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, we were hooked on them. And that was actually before the movies came out. Sean uh, Connery hadn't even been cast yet, uh, but we absolutely loved those. And then after that was John D. McDonald, uh, his, his novels. I, I just read all of those. So, uh, and of course those were mysteries, but thrillers. I, I, I just, I was hooked on thrillers. I, the adrenaline rush of those books was something special to me. Understood, understood. All right, I have a question um, specifically for Frederick, and this is from Donna, uh, referencing the Swedish series that you had said inspired you. And she's curious to know if you have an opinion on what it is about those Swedish, Danish, Icelandic noir that is so compelling. As librarians, we get lots of requests for all that kind of Scandinavian dark stuff. Donna is saying her patrons can't get enough and she's wondering as a writer, what's your viewpoint on what makes those books so compelling? Well, I, again, it's what we said earlier. I, I think they're very character oriented um, and Obviously, they're all mostly very, very dark, and um, there is something about uh, how the the authors dig into the crime and and ex expose what's what's going on in, in the characters' lives. Um, so, uh, in in the case of the Martin Beck series, I think it's the characters of the detectives themselves. I mean, some of them are. Um, incompetent and lazy and and yet they they work on this crime and they solve the crime but they're just ordinary ordinary people and so it's a very it's it's a very sort of i guess i'd say like un-american like unheroic kind mm. of a detective story mm -hmm. um, but you know each one of those scandinavian authors is, is a little bit different um you know wallander henning mankell is is those crimes are usually pretty dark, dark stories. They and are very grim, aren't they? Yeah. Very grim, yeah. And so um, I, I don't know, each one is different, but I, I think they do a very good job at, at character at working on the character of the detectives and the victims. Okay, thank you for that. All right, I have a question uh, for all three of you. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it of each of you. This one comes from Miriam. She's got a writing style question. She is curious to know, do you write your books from beginning to end or do you shuffle the chapters around as the story solidifies? And now Thomas and Frederick, I know you have both said that you do a lot of rewriting. So I'd like to kind of explore that a little further as well. Do you write a whole thing at one time and then in your rewrites, do you start mixing it up or you tell us a little bit about that? Frederick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on you again for that one first. Yeah, so I, I, um, I developed this structure where I have short chapters and each chapter has two scenes. And um, each chapter is 2,000 words, and, and uh, they're very short scenes with different characters. And so, you know, I have five detectives, and they sort of rotate around. And, and so I, the way I write them is I write a scene with one detective, I write a scene with another detective, and then after I've gotten 15 or 20 of them, I start to put them together in order. But no, I don't write from beginning of the book to, to the end. And um, when I start, I don't really know what the ending is, but uh -huh. I figure it out. Okay. And when I'm about third of the way through, I do know where the ending is, but at the beginning, I don't. I always love kind of hearing hearing how that, that works in people's heads. Thomas, how about you? 
Well, I, obviously, I started at the beginning. I know what the, the opening scene looks like, uh, although I rewrite it like until it just, I, even I get tired of it. Um, I know what the final scene looks like, although I don't necessarily know who the bad guy or the bad guys are. I don't really know who they are until about the middle of the book. Uh, so the whole thing is, is an exploration for me. And each chapter is new. And sometimes at some point in time, those characters take on a life of their own and they, they have little conversations in, in your head. And sometimes while you're sleeping, you can hear them talking or, or when you're driving, you hear them talking and, and it's very schizophrenic and it scares the hell out of my wife. Um, Hopefully they don't tell you to go left when you're supposed to be going right, but. <laughs> no, but sometimes they yell at me. So, I, you know, <laughs> uh, but I do go back and of course a mystery is a puzzle. So you, you, you need to go back and leave clues or red herrings. And so I will go back and rewrite things Things once I figure out where I'm going, um, because the whole thing you, you you want people to think that they can they can solve it. You don't really want them to solve it until the end. Uh, so it's a little bit of a magic trick. I love it. As a reader, that's always my favorite thing. I'm a, I'm a big suspense and thriller reader, and I absolutely. All of my favorite books are the ones where I haven't figured it out until it's revealed. That always, I just get, I do a little clap even, I think, sometimes when, when I'm like, I didn't guess it, yay! So thank you for your for your thoughtfulness in putting that sort of thing together. And Luca, how about you? Do you sit and, and write it all the way through? Do you mix it up? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't do what Frederick does, but I, that would, I, I, I'd lose my mind. Uh, I, I, I have to go from the beginning. My first drafts t tend to be cut. The first third is usually cut to the bone because it's usually me trying to figure out the story. Um, and it's uh, just be, you know, people just sitting around going like, we need to do something. Let's do something about the, and so we get rid of all of that and, and, and that happens in, in, in the rewriting. Um, but yeah, I could, I can't, I, I, I do, Every book has been different. I'd love to say that, like, you know, oh, I have a very set pattern where I'll know where I'm going or anything like that. I don't, but there are books where I've known exactly what's going to happen all the way through, uh, and those books tend to get written very quickly and with, with very little uh, worry, and they're brilliant. I think that's happened twice in the last 12 years. Um, most of the time, it's just me banging my head against my desk and, so, you know, what happens next, what happens next, and trying to find out what you know work out what what, what it is that i'm going to you know you know where i'm going to take the story um but yeah it's 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 been different with every book i'd love i'd love if it was the same because it made things a lot easier uh the book i'm writing at the moment has been it's been six months of just trying to work out what the central theme of the sort of the, the book is and that took six months for me to work out but it also took thousands of thousands of words that will mm -hmm. never see the light of day um, so yeah, I mean, I think you find your story in rewriting, um, you find your plot, but I think the characters are always much easier to come by. I think, you know, that, that always feels to me like the bread and butter of it, of, of, of like, this is, I know what this book's going to, you know, center around this person and that I've always found a lot easier than, than plot. All right. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Frederick, I actually have not so much a question, but a suggestion from one of our audience members, Suzanne, um, who enjoyed the fact that you have participated in that Citizens Police Academy. And she says, um, if you ever have the chance to participate in anything else like that, she has done her local airport's aviation academy and has learned a lot. So she would like to recommend doing something like that if you're ever thinking about, you know, how that helps to develop characters by watching real people in these jobs that you never really get an inside look at otherwise. So I wanted to point that out. Um, and then I have another question here. I'm going to probably take us right up to this time because there's so many good questions here. But this one has come actually... Um, worded a little differently from Steve and from Carly. They would like to know, and of course, where did I just lose this question? Oh, what other genre would you be writing in if you weren't writing mysteries? Or are you mystery ride or die? Tell us about it, Luca. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think with I mean with the Bonekeeper that was me trying to write uh, you know a horror mystery. Uh, mm -hmm. I was trying to I was trying to become like the British the well the, the Liverpudlian Stephen King, uh, and and that obviously was not um, 
it was not intentional. <laughs> but that was kind of where my love of horror came from reading those books as a kid. And, 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 and I always wanted to kind of try my hand at it. But I, I, it, it, it is a very different, uh, it's a very different kind of genre to writing. So I haven't followed that up. Um, but if I wasn't writing mysteries, it would be horror because that is my that is my you know passion when it comes to reading. As I do love a good horror novel. Very good, very good. Thomas, how about you? Would you like to write some chiclet, perhaps, or women's <laughs> fiction, since you've got the got the characters? <laughs> no, my imagination is way too dark. Uh, I'm 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 kind of like Luca. I, I I love Stephen King. I love Dean Koontz. Um, so horror would probably be my my next uh, genre if I were going to you know take that on. And and frankly, all my books are are pretty dark anyway. Uh, my my editor says I'm a really nice guy, and you know I smile and I laugh and I tell jokes. Right, looking at you here on screen, I wouldn't I wouldn't find you so dark at all. But it's... no, but boy, you know some of those murders are pretty horrific. I mean, they, they, they surprise me, and my my wife says she sleeps with one eye open. So I, you know, there you go, smart lady, smart lady. All right, and Frederick, how about you? So I actually uh, took a year off from the series and wrote a literary novel. Uh, and it's a story of a man who has a heart attack, uh, and the title is, it's called Cardiology, and I'm currently looking for a publisher for it. Uh, so it's very different. It is not a mystery. It is not a police procedural. It is a literary novel. Um, I had a heart attack myself back in 2016, and I wanted to write about it. I didn't want to write a memoir, but I wanted to write a story because um, it, it was an interesting thing to have happen. And so, um, like all writers, anything happens in your life, you turn it into a story. And, and um, so it's, it's a literary novel, not a mystery. Okay. Fascinating. You didn't want to go back to write one of those Victorian no. giant 800 page books? <laughs> no. I think that's a little bit beyond me. No. All right. All right. So um, I think I'm going to, I'm really going to squeak us up because I have, I have more questions I want to get to here. So we have a question um, specifically for Thomas from Donna, who is interested in your years working for newspapers. And she's curious to know if you look at crime and criminals differently than perhaps your average person based on your experiences doing reporting and working in the news. Well, I mean, yeah, um, criminals, all they all have a backstory. They, they're not necessarily inherently evil. You do have some inherently evil people out there with absolutely no conscience. Um, and I won't even talk about the school shooting that just happened. That, that's just, uh, just horrific. Um, but most criminals, they don't start out being criminals. And a lot of them uh, feel they're doing the right thing. Sometimes they steal just to feed their family. Or in some cases, uh, they'll they'll steal to to feed an addiction, and that addiction, uh, you know, they would just as soon not be addicted. Nobody really wants to be addicted. So um, yeah, these these are human beings, and they have senses of humor, and and they have families. So as I write the criminal, I try to write them as humanly as possible because they do have more than just the one side. They're just it's not just a cardboard cutout. That is fascinating. Thank you. And Luca, I've got a question specifically for you. I just lost it though. Where did it go? Ah, this is from Donna, who is curious to know. So you've, you've told us how the Bone Keeper was inspired by a real local legend, and she knows you've got many standalone novels. So she's curious to know if any other settings of your books have also been inspired by real people or real news stories. I, I think I think most of the books come from some kind of, of thing I've either watched or read about. That happens all the time. Um, but it, sometimes it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint um, what they might be. Uh, the Bone Keeper is, is one of those that I can really pinpoint and go, that is it. I know exactly where I've kind of got the idea for that story from. Uh, the, the book that comes out later this year, um, You Never Said Goodbye, that is very much the, the first time that I've ever based something on on a very personal story, because um, you know it, it's it, it's you know about a, a, a guy trying to find out what happened to his mum, 
Uh, and that is very much based on something that happened to me when I was eight years old. My mum uh, left and then we didn't see her for months. And I've always kind of wondered if she would, if she'd never come back, you know, how would I have, you know, kind of gone on um, without the knowledge of what actually happened to her? Um, so exploring that through fiction is, is you know, Ooh, through writing it yeah. was, you know, a really interesting process. But yeah, I think it's it's different for every book. But yeah, it, I think every book that I've I've written has been based on some kind of little kernel of of of, of a story that I've I've either you know been watching a documentary or some kind of drama on telly or I've uh, I've, I've read a news story or something like that. It, it's very difficult to pinpoint that. All right. Well, it is um, seven o'clock, so I unfortunately am going to have to stop the questions, which I do think I could just chat with you friends all night. So thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, Luca, now you can go and get some sleep finally. So thank you. It's 1 uh, and it's thanks 1 for coming back to us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this was really a delight. I appreciate the three of you taking your time to chat no with problem. me. And I know our audience appreciates it very much. It was fantastic. And I appreciate our wonderful audience. Thank you for listening to us tonight and for participating. Um, our friends at Sourcebooks have put the winners' names in the uh, chat there. We've got Jennifer Windery, Steve Thomas, and Ann Stevens. If you email Emily Ludloff at sourcebooks.com with your address, you will get your mystery book prize. And thank you again, the three of you, Frederick, Thomas, Luca. It really was, I, I really think we could just be chatting for quite a long time here. So I, I hate to thank cut you. it off, but thank you. Thank, thank you, you so for much, Rebecca. Us. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, you for sharing your wonderful characters with us as well. Thank so I want much. to encourage everyone to join us for the next Mystery at the Library event, which is next month, Wednesday, June 29th at 7 p.m. Same bat time, same bat channel, as they used to say. Um, I'll be talking to Revis Z. Wortham, the Spur Award-winning author of The Texas Job. So we've entered the registration information for next month's event into the chat, so go ahead and RSVP for that. Thank you again to our fantastic three authors. Thank you all for joining us, and happy reading. Thank you.